Uh, Frank, I believe you and Kenny Haddock made the trip to D.C., Baltimore area around 1960. Take yeah, us there, please. Yeah, it's awful We uh, first came to Baltimore, and a guy ran into us by the name of Carl Shasky. I don't know if Tom knew him or not. I did. So we stayed with him a week, and we was uh, trying to find a place to play. So that's when we met Porter Synagogue, I mean Porter Church. <laughs> <laughs> He's played a place called Whitey's, and he gave us a job with him. That's how it started. I forget how we met Tom. Now. You were in the group of the Franklin County Boys. You yeah, that, that. I was Billy about Baker that. Billy Baker involved with that? Yeah, uh, was that mostly in the Baltimore area. Yeah, and uh, the other guy's name was Frankie Long. I mean Frankie Short. Frankie Short. Yeah. And uh, let's see, uh, and uh, Lamar Greer. I think Lamar Greer, the first record he ever done was at Pete Roberts' studio with me. We did the Leon Morris, I believe. It was. Mm -hmm. When did uh, Harley Red Allen make his way to the D.C. area? And oh, tell us about that uh, yep. to renew the re relationship you had in the Dayton, uh, Ohio area. Yeah, when we moved to D.C., Red followed me down there. <laughs> and and uh, actually... What happened was, I ain't going to tell you why he moved down there. Uh, he might not want anybody to know about it. <laughs> but uh, then he came down and we started playing and we got Tom Morgan who started playing bass with us. Uh, you came out and did a demo recording out at uh, my recording studio. And at that time, you had uh, Robbie Robinson Oh, playing, yeah. playing banjo with you, but he was from Columbus area, wasn't he? Let's talk about WDON now. Uh, first of all, it's probably directed to uh, uh, Pete. How did it come about, first of all? The, they, if you could give us a little back history of WDON, was it the, the dad, uh, Everett uh, Dillard, or the son, Don Dillard, or right. someone else that uh, facilitated Well, it was, it was a local... Uh, yeah, I got the show. And we'll turn it over to Pete right. to get the... That, uh, that's right, because uh, it was one of the things where the, the sponsor, we were able to get a sponsor, and they all of a sudden they became interested in you as a band. And uh, I was working for the sponsor. You were, he, Frank was working for the sponsor, Banner Glass. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think it was Red or Frank contacted WDON. They had a number of local bands on the station you know at the time and uh, I, th I would say that, uh, that Red and Frank as far as music was concerned were a step above most of the local bands that they had on and uh, so we started cutting uh, half hour radio programs to not unlike the way that even the, the, the bands that would play the local radio station to promote their uh, personal appearance calendar. And uh, they would, uh, you know, we would play 15 minutes, have a 15 minute sponsor by Banner and Glass, and then and we'd tell them where we were playing. And at the time, we were, we all were playing a little bit around, but not a whole lot. And uh, that was one of the reasons why we got it, why the Red wanted to get it, because that was a way to promote the, you know, the appearances that you were making. And because I had a studio in the early uh, years of the studio, it made it pretty simple because the studio was in the basement of my house and, uh, you know, we could do it all there. Uh, question on the studio. How did you, uh, the name Winwood? It's the win name of your publishing company, too. Yeah. Any, any back history on, on that name? Not really. Uh, uh, at the time, uh, John Duffy was uh, semi-involved with it, and John was the one who came up with the name, and I found out later that it was the name of a street over in Bethesda near where he lived. So it wasn't any brilliant, uh, you know, deep meaning behind it but it just was a name that was has not had not been used at the time 
Now, we had made the fatal mistake of uh, spelling it with a Y rather than an I, so we probably lost a lot of the, you know, <laughs> some royalties down the road because people were looking for W-I-N rather than W-Y-N. So, eh, you know. This man to my left had the challenging task to go in there cold turkey and follow with something creative and coherent after Frank had got through ringing out the mandolin <laughs> on every break. So this was Pete's challenge, and I don't mind telling you, I played with several banjo players in this world, but the way he handled that, I think will be fully evidenced by the recordings that are getting ready to come mm. out. Well, Love thank you, brother. You. Thank here, you. Here. Let's talk about the uh, uh, the venues, quote unquote, Lone Pine Inn, of course, and Cousin Nick's, as were you know the advertised places. Uh, uh, how did the playing come about? What was the reciprocal arrangement of? Uh, obviously, this is their plug. We called it un underwriting in public broadcasting, as yeah. you know. But back then, it was just plain old sponsorship. It's plain old sponsorship. Well, uh, I was playing a little bit, you know, on the side. And uh, as, as my memory serves me, uh, I was playing with a group of Van and June Helms. And uh, Van, at the time, was selling, uh, like, candy bars and, and cigarettes, that kind of stuff. And uh, this uh, cousin Nix was uh, right across the street from one of the D.C. bus barns. And uh, it was just a standard little uh, local restaurant. And, uh, you know, talking with the guy, the band was very, uh, uh, you know, friendly about it, about it. And he told the guy that, uh, that they were playing a little bit of music. Well, one thing led to another. And so we got hired in there like on Tuesday and Thursday and and there was a lot of cross-pollination of musicians uh, who worked in and out of there. And uh, Cousin Nix was one of them that became, I guess, our second sponsor in addition to Banner Glass. And uh, so that kept the radio station happy with, you know, having a, a half-hour sponsored program. Let me go back to Cousin Nix. Uh, at the point that Carter Stanley needed some financial uplifting, uh, we went to Cousin Nick's and had a fundraiser up there. And I'll never forget, Patsy Stoneman walked in and she said, boy, this place sure is dead. And she took the jumper cables and got everything jazzed and going. I'll never <laughs> forget the, the uh, challenge, the skill that she brought to that in that particular place. Segway to the to the Lone Pine Inn, Germantown, Maryland, which had a uh, you know one in interesting aspect to its uh, call it its demographic. If someone could address that, uh, I will. In fact, I was had played there for almost a month before I realized that it was a uh, it was a biracial situation, and uh, we would eat and come in to the bar and usually get dinner there and I didn't never realize that uh, the, the place was had a a uh, African-American segment it was uh, and you never know it because of the way the hedges were that uh, <laughs> the, the parking was on one side and uh, the, you know the white was on one side and the, the black was on the other that was nice though yeah. Good place to play. Yeah. I didn't know a thing about it like that. And the only time I knew about it, I think it was the last day we played there when it was leaving. <laughs> no. <laughs> but I've got some memories of the Lone Pine and uh, Kenny Cat uh, Haddock, hereafter known as Codfish, <laughs> yeah. would uh, hire me some, most of the time for several months, but I'd go play my flat top Martin guitar. Kenny would play the dobro, and if somebody could stand there and just play a mandolin, he was happy that we got, you know, paid for 
those three people, and we played dances, mm -hmm. and we watched fights break out. We didn't have the bar or the uh, chicken wire, but mm -hmm. it was it was a pretty wild place on Saturday night. Oh yeah. What about uh, uh, listener feedback? Did anyone uh, was, was there any good uh, reciprocity in terms of listeners or? or bookings coming in, as you know, you're, you're working the territory. Did the station, quote, share the cards and letters with you, or was that pretty they much a non-entity? They hid those. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or Tom Morgan did. <laughs> now, we had a lot of listeners, though, actually. Yeah, and, and they could even at the it. time, At the time, uh, it was the major bluegrass outlet, so to speak, with, for the live bands around uh, there were other country music stations around town who had country music, but uh, at the time, I don't remember that there were any bluegrass bands to speak of. There wasn't none at all. On, on the radio. So that kind of gave us a corner on the market. Let's talk about the material. We need to turn Frank loose on the mandolin here. So material that we use. Frank's ready to play the new camp town and and uh, you're in the you're at Winwood Studios. You're going to come up with 15 minutes. Are we, uh, 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 I assume we're working a lot with uh, from songbooks, from memory, a combination of the two in terms of, of material picked for the broadcasts. Just memory only. Memory only. Yeah, you know, most of it, you know, we use the Bill Clifton songbook, but that's about that was pretty well what the, the stuff that was released on folkways came from and we just went through the Bill Clifton songbook and you know and I don't think did he ever rehearse it I don't think, no. he, <laughs> don't think I don't think so it didn't I, if it I, didn't make it the first time you know we might go back and do it again but generally we no. never did go over anything two times I don't think no. that's my recollection also <laughs> but I've made a little contribution though I'd sneak in a Bales Brothers thing like I guess I was just going dreaming just the same. And uh, we, we did a little flavoring there that uh, went a little different direction. Well, that's one of the beauties, I think, of the repertoire, that, that it's mixed. You weren't just covering the, you know, the, the basic, quote, book, quote, unquote, the Bales Brothers thing sneaking in there, uh, uh, wonderful harmony, and mixed that was duets, trios, solos, that all was over the place. Th that was partially, at least, m what I was thinking about, because I, while I could play the standard uh, little cabin home on the hill and that kind of stuff but I, I got bored easily so I started looking for other pieces of material that would work in a bluegrass context and that carried over when I went with the country gentleman. Sometimes me and Red uh, would, would write a song before we get to the studio like uh, that one you sent me a copy of it uh, years ago uh, what was the name? A real pretty song. We'd be in the car and sing, start humming around, saying, write a song on the way to a studio. We'd get in there and do it. Like that song, Don't Lie to Me. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Me and Red wrote that, mostly in the car going to the studio. Tom was already there. He beat us to it. And we'd just get in there and play it one time. Thanks we'll to everybody that. in this project, <laughs> including our producer. Thank you, Tom Morgan. But you gentlemen are the ones to be applauded. Mr. Tom Morgan, Mr. Pete Kuykendall, the great Frank Wakefield, assembling you here has been very, very special for us. You have shed light on an illustrious history in bluegrass music, and we thank you. I'm Mark Yacovone, speaking for Tom Minty and the entire production staff here at Patuxent Music. I encourage each and every one of you to seek out the memorable 1963 WDON broadcast recordings of Red Allen, Frank Wakefield, and the Kentuckians. The contributions they made are timeless. <laughs>